you. Welcome to the Dub Show. I appreciate you guys, man. Check me out. I got an L at a young age, stretched out. Gave me 24, homie, I got five out. Now on YouTube, trying to get a paper route. Come and chill, you know the deal. We have some grown shit. What's cracking, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. New video. Anyhow, um, today's video was has been inspired by uh, the homie Beatles. Uh, Beatles has been a subscriber to the channel for a little while, and lately he's been coming on the panel, right, on our lives, uh, chilling with us, having a good time. And uh, last night, he asked me a question about um, when I was incarcerated. And, um, you know, for those of you that know, you know, for those of you that don't, um, in 1993, I was arrested for murder. Uh, in 1994, I was convicted of second degree murder and given 20 years to life. And so he asked me, hey, when you were in prison, did you um, just never give up hope? You know, that, you know, one day I'm going to get out. And I told him, nah, it wasn't even like that at all. Um, the day they put the handcuffs on me, in my mind, I was done with the streets. I would never see the streets again. And I wouldn't even, like, whatever was going to happen outside of the jail walls was none of my concern. I couldn't do nothing for it or about it. And um, so then today when I woke up, I said, you know what? I think I should do a video and just give my two cents on uh, the way California was in the 80s and the little bit of the 90s I was out. Um, you know, I was only out five months of the 90s. Uh, I went to the California Youth Authority in 1989 and I paroled January 5th, 1993. June 29th of 1993, I was arrested for murder. Okay. For people that are not, okay, I was born in 1974. So uh, the 80s is when California pretty much went buck wild. Um, and again, the 90s were, for the, the few months I was out, it was, it was like steamrolling. What was happening in the eighties was just, it was, it was, it was, it was different, right? But you know, if you look back, you can Google the movies of the eighties, right? Uh, and the nineties, the music of the eighties and the nineties. Um, if you remember, those of you old enough to, those of you that aren't old enough to, maybe this will come as a surprise to you because. Um, you're just not aware of it, but um, what was happening in California was so influential as far as, as the gang culture and the way of living in California, gang banging, basically. Prior to, you know, they say Ice-T was the first gangster rapper, but, you know, no disrespect to Ice-T, but, you know, N.W.A. was the ones that are more... You know, prior to Ice T and NWA, but again, really NWA. Prior to that, them coming out and doing their thing, um, rap was pretty um, peaceful. Um, the you know New York had a chokehold on rap, and there was a lot of um, you had like I remember guys like um, Boogie Down Productions, Karis One. Um, you had, um, uh, what were their, their name, uh, the fight, the power, the ones that did fight the power, public enemy, you had public enemy, you had stuff like that. You had heavy D, you know, which was more, you know, I don't know yet, but you had a lot of music that was more about being proud of being black, um, partying music. It was hip hop. Right. And then you just had these dudes come out of West, the West side, the West coast. Right. And they were telling a story of what they saw, 
you know, the New York rappers were telling the story of what they were seeing, but they were keeping it clean in order to get radio play. Then you had these dudes on the West Coast just come out and say, you know what? And yeah, you know, and NWA, they were not gangbangers. You know, the only one I think that was in the vicinity of righteous gangbangers was Easy E, right? But what they were doing is they were telling the story of what was happening around them and with people that they knew and grew up with. And it changed hip hop. Hip hop was forever changed by the West Coast. They brought that gangster stuff with them, right? And so, like I was saying, if you go back and you Google movies from the 80s into the 90s, you'll see you had, you know, Boys in the Hood, you had Menace to Society, you had movies like that, right? But then going into the 90s, then you had movies like American Me and Blood In and Blood Out. So you had California gang culture, whether it was the streets or prison, infiltrating America's mindset. And honestly, it doesn't even, it's just superficial. It's on the surface. When you watch those movies and you hear, when you, when you hear that music, you could you'd be like, damn, it's kind of, it was wild out there. But I don't think you can fully grasp the mindset that those of us that grew up in that era had. Um, people say, oh, well, you know, if they had cameras back then, you know, you guys wouldn't have been doing, I, I don't believe that to be true. It was such a, it was such a, a different time. It was so um, callous. It was so um, brutal at that time. You know, I, I tell people all the time, I feel like Chicago right now is where California was in the 80s, man. You know, people doing whatever they want to do, uh, whenever they want to do it. And it's, it's, it's just buck wild out here. The mentality was, um, you know, it's hard for me to use the words because YouTube's tripping, but I'm going to erase this person before he can erase me. And, you know, it was not, um, I mean, going to prison when I did, I mean, I met a lot of dudes that had multiple bodies. It wasn't one or two, but multiple, you know, I met dudes with seven or eight bodies and, um, you know, you might ask, well, why aren't they on the death penalty? Because a lot of times what would happen is they would fight all the cases and get wind up getting convicted of two or three rather than seven or eight. But they did do those seven or eight or more, just didn't get caught for them or convicted for them. You know, it was a completely different era. I remember, you know, everybody knows about MS, right? And I had a good uh, friend, a good camarada of mine. We were in Corcoran Shoe together. And he was from MS, right? No, that was his homeboy. We were in New Folsom together in, uh, in the Ad City. And I asked him about, you know, hey, Holmes, how was it for you, you know, coming over here and shit? Like, cause you, know, you guys be mowing stuff down. And he told me, he was like, look, homie, um, I was part of the war in my country, you know? We were fighting soldiers. He goes, and when I came over here, he goes, my homies were like, hey, you wanna, we're going to go out in a little while. You're going you're gonna to trip out on this. And he goes, and we went, and, and he goes, and we pulled up on these vatos, got out, and we started, you know, shooting. He goes, and to me, that was fun. He goes, I wasn't fighting the government. I wasn't fighting soldiers. I was just having fun in the streets. That was the type of mentality a lot of dudes had, you know. And um, everyone... Everyone during that time, like when I answered Beto's question, that's how it was, man. Everybody knew, like, I'm going to use my gun or I'm going to use my knife or I'm going to use whatever I have to do to get the job done. And I know I'll never see the streets again. It was a given. That's what you understood. And that's what you were down for back then. I can tell you that for me personally, because of my, you know, issues, uh, you know, growing up in a violent home, feeling unloved, unwanted, you know, I, I wanted to impress the streets and be impressive in the streets and impress those around me in jail. Um, and so I really didn't care about myself. So I was incapable of caring about anyone else. And I wasn't the only one. That's all that was around me. I remember thinking there was never a doubt in my mind about me going to prison. 
and I've spoken about this in other videos, how um, I remember being in the California Youth Authority and we heard about Pelican Bay Shoe and just Pelican Bay, the prison itself. And, you know, when we're kids, man, and we heard that whole, all the rumors, all the, you know, the showers at the back of your cell, a door opens, the yard's connected to your cell and you can't even touch your mail and this and that. And instead of us hearing that and being like, damn, homie, I don't want to go there. We were like, let's see who's there for like, it was like we were in a race with each other. Who was going to get there first? And um, I was there and within, what was it? That was probably, uh, that conversation probably was in 91. And I was in Pelican Bay just a few years later in the shoe, you know. I was manifesting my own destiny with the things that I was believing in and the things that I was saying. Um, but, you know, I really wanted to make this video with clips and with photographs of the 80s. But you guys can Google that because as I was doing it, I was getting a lot of things on the, on the pictures or the videos copyright protected. And I said, you know, I don't want to kill the video when you guys can go look it up. But I just wanted to give you guys a glimpse into the mindset back then. You know, it was a very unfortunate era. It was the crack era. It was when gangbanging exploded. Um, that era is the reason why there are California gangs spread out throughout the United States because people understood, especially the dudes from LA, especially the Crips. I, I give them that. You know, they um, they realized they can sell, you know, 300 sack of dope in LA could sell for 2000 in another part of the country. So they moved out their setup shop, you know, um, but that's the era that the eighties is the era that, that influenced most gang culture across the United States, all based out of California and a California mindset. It's an unfortunate thing, but it's the reality. So I'll go ahead and end this video here. Everybody, please stay safe, stay smart, and tell the ones you love that you love them. I'm out.